I think we've already established at this point that I have a book collecting problem. So I get lots of people that ask me, how can you buy seven full-length novels from an author that you've never even read before? Well, I mean, I feel like sometimes you just know that an author is going to be for you. Has that ever happened to anybody else? Well, I mean, we're going to find out because uh, Faithful and the Fallen is happening. So let's take a look at The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn. Memory is a double-edged sword. It can keep you strong through dark times, but it can also cripple you and keep you locked in a moment that no longer exists. There is only now, this moment, and the one that follows. You can tell much about a man by the company he keeps, by his friends, by his enemies. Both the brave man and the coward feel the same. The only difference between them is that the brave man faces his fear does not run. This world may be full of greed and tragedy and darkness, but I am fortunate beyond measure to have such people about me. To my thinking, though, it's what happens before death that's important. All of us die, but how many really live? So I shall stay and tell my tale, and hope that it may serve some purpose, that I shall see it and learn that the future will not repeat the mistakes of the past. That is my prayer, but what use is a prayer to a God that has abandoned all things? The God War is coming. John Glenn was born in 1968 in Singapore before studying and eventually lecturing at Brighton University. He began writing in his 30s with The Faithful and the Fallen, beginning in 2002 as a hobby. A decade later, Malice was released and won the David Gimmel Morningstar Award for Best Fantasy Debut. So after seven critically and fan acclaimed novels, why did I decide now was the time to read The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn? Let's talk about it. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Truth and courage. Mike here to talk to you today about John Gwynn's The Faithful and the Fallen series. I have started Malice because I wanted to have a little bit to talk to you guys about before I started this because if I didn't get like a little bit of what the book was about, I felt like I was just going to be telling you guys, uh, yeah, it's been recommended to me by a lot of people and I like the reviews for it. That would be the only reason I would have to tell you. Uh, I, I, so this is gonna kind of be a, a little bit of a hybrid of my why I decided to read and maybe why you should read now that I've got a little bit of facts into it. Obviously, there'll be no spoilers. Don't have to worry about anything like that. But um, I have already started this book. I'm about two thirds through it. If that tells you how much I'm enjoying it. Uh, I just started it a couple days ago. Uh, it's uh, actually interfering with my schoolwork just a little bit. But uh, if you aren't a everyday follower of the channel, um, you're going to hear some things that they've probably gotten sick of hearing me talk about because my weekly updates, I've been talking about how excited I was to talk about this for probably the last four or five weekly updates. So uh, you guys, I apologize because um, I'm going to repeat some of that now in case this is someone who's just now finding the channel, is curious about the series and wants to know a little bit. So um, this series will started being written in 2012 and it concluded in 2016. Uh, I first heard about it from the subreddit r slash uh, fantasy on Reddit, and uh, a lot of people in there were just like, why are more people not talking about this series? It is incredible. And I just, okay, you know, you hear that a lot, but I kept seeing more and more posts about it, more and more. So I, all right, I'll go ahead and scribble this one down. And uh, when I went ahead and looked it up on Goodreads, you, if you are a, a fantasy fan at all, and you go to Goodreads and you check out just about any fantasy book, the top review almost every time is going to be this reviewer named Petrick. Uh, if you if you don't know who he is, look him up. Uh, Petrick, he, uh, he reviews just about every fantasy book that you can imagine. He usually gets uh, advanced reader copies. But uh, besides, uh, he didn't uh, finish Wheel of Time. He did enough Wheel of Time. And I didn't really care for Name of the Wind. Everything else, I think him and I seem to align a lot on. We both love Brandon Sanderson. We both love Joe Abercrombie. But the one author he brings up all the time that I had never really gotten to was John Gwynn. And he just makes it sound like this guy is the hidden gem in the fantasy genre. So obviously, that is what really spiked my uh, real curiosity 
about this series because I was like, why do I not hear more about this? And I mean, all I had to do really was see the covers and just see these things were just freaking stunning to know that, yeah, that's something I'd probably read just for the covers. And then you look up a picture of the guy and he's, uh, you know, he looks like a Viking, basically. Uh, so that was really all I really had to go off of. Uh, basically, anybody I know that's a friend of the channel that's talked to me before is just like, man, this is going to be right in your wheelhouse. This is exactly what you're looking for. And so I was like, all right. I heard a lot of Ice and, uh, Song of Ice and Fire comparisons uh, coming into it. And then I heard, uh, you know, that negative T word. And by that T word, I mean trope. And I hate using the word trope now because of the, all the negative connotations that have got around it. But uh, so when that, that word comes up, I first off, a red flag goes up. But then also I start taking it with a grain of salt now because nowadays, if it's just plain good versus evil, people call that a fantasy trope. So I think it's a word that's gotten overused at this point. And a lot of people are using it without no. It's like when you call something that's really great overrated because you didn't like it. Uh, it's not always the case. It's not always the case. So uh, I try not to uh, to uh, be disturbed by a review that mentions the word trope, but uh, some of you see for this series, you do see that come up. But then they also say, but that don't matter because it's still written so well in a way that you're going to appreciate. So obviously, guys, the reviews is what got me here. Uh, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about what it's about now that I'm a little bit into the series. It takes place in this world called the Banished Lands. Now, this is where a violent past of armies of men and giants, they fought really big battles until they kind of finally settled into an uneasy peace. You know, nothing was ever really resolved, but they've kind of been living that way for a while. But now there's signs of all these uh, prophecies and dark omens popping up, you know, where there's like stones bleeding, there's solar eclipses, there's people having out-of-body dream experiences and, and talking about, you know, chosen ones. And, and there's more telling of a, of a god war between these angels and demons. It's like, okay, this is... A little different than most fancy stories I've read. Uh, but, you know, kings, they start preparing for the worst. You know, they start locking down their borders. They start uh, looking for answers. They start seeking out these two prophesied champions, one being the Black Sun, the other being the Bright Star. And uh, they're basically, these are the two that are going to decide the war to end all wars, this God War, so to be. So uh, the story follows about six POV characters so far, if there's a seventh one in this book, I haven't gotten to that person yet. But those characters are Evnis, Corbin, uh, Siwen. Uh, I say Siwen. Some people are. I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, Evnis, Corbin, Siwen, Veritas, Castell, and Camlin. Uh, <laughs> I said it's my Will of Time bias or recency bias with Will of Time uh, that this character's name was Camlin, C-A-M-L-I-N. I started pronouncing it Camlin, like the you know the city in Will of Time. Anyways, I. Yeah, this is going to go well. I can tell how well this is going. I still got Wheel of Time on the brand. I just finished it a couple days ago, guys. Uh, but uh, I would talk about Cywen because I've been reading C Y W E N. And I've even actually tweeted uh, John Gwynn. I, by the way, he's very active on Twitter. He usually responds to your stuff. He's just on a different time zone than me, so he hasn't actually responded yet. Uh, but uh, I asked him, I was like, I have been saying Cywen. I see some people in the, uh, in the fantasy Reddit saying that it's pronounced either uh, Cowen or Cowen. And I'm like, uh, well, I don't know how we get Cohen out of, out, of, out of, or I can see Kaiwen maybe, because you got Corbin and Kaiwen, you know, the brother and sister. But anyway, I'm saying Cywen, so if uh, you guys feel like I'm saying that wrong, this is what happens when you read a book and you don't listen to audiobooks. You you read it how you see it. So I'm going to say Cywen in this review. Okay, so Evnus, he is a counselor uh, to a king, and he, he's got kind of a shady past, but much shadier uh, kind of future intentions, so to speak. He is a definitely playing the game of houses right now. Uh, then you got Corbin. He's your traditional son of a blacksmith. There it gets your, your, your first uh, T word that people like to use or whatever. Uh, he longs to become a warrior and kind of leave this, this lifestyle behind. Then you got uh, uh, Cywin, his sister. She is a uh, sister to Corbin, and she's got a very special set of skills, as Liam Neeson would say. And that is particularly, she's really good with horses, and she can throw knives like a bad, like like John Wick, basically. She can throw knives. Uh, she's pretty awesome with the knives. Uh, so if you like weapons, guys, this is a story for you. Uh, Veritas, he is the first sword of the future king, Prince Nather. Nather? 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 I say it differently almost every time I see it. Uh, Castell, he is the nephew of a king and has some family issues to work out. He's got like some kind of uh, blood feud going on with one of his cousins. And, uh, you know, that's always good stuff in these kind of books. And then you got Camelin, which is an outlaw from a group of, of uh, brigands in the bordering forest. And uh, right away, I'm like, okay, what I like about this compared to most of these stories is, first off, you get 
such a nice variety of POV characters. So that way you don't have anybody feeling like they're just, okay, it's the same thing from a different person's point of view. It's all different locations. And uh, I like that one of them is actually an outlaw. That's really cool. And then you got another one that is very clearly not such a good dude. And this isn't in that whole grim dark way, which I'll talk about in a minute. Not like you're thinking. This isn't like first law where, you know, none of them are good dudes. Uh, but uh, it's just, it, what I mean by that is this is a series that has a very clear light versus dark kind of thing to it. And uh, it's very clear that he's on the side of the dark, you know, from the uh, from the prologue in the first chapter. It's, it's very clear right away that Evness is not the best of dudes. So I like getting it from uh, that point of view as well as also getting it from the point of view of an outlaw. I think that's a really, really great idea. But uh, I think it's a really good mix because you do have all these lands and regions and stuff. And so it's good to have, you know, kind of one character from each place and then only having like your only real uh, in the same location, just being a uh, Cywin and Corbin, since they're brother and sister, being in the same place. But uh, I hear this series compared to David Gimmel a lot. I can't say I've never read David Gimmel. Uh, I've had Legend on my TBR for a while. That's part of the uh, Drenai saga, I believe it's called. Uh, so if you guys know anything about that, okay, you might be more into this uh, off of that recommendation. Apparently, he is a very big fan of of David Gimmel. Uh, in fact, he actually won that uh, that 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 award. Uh, what was it called? The the David Gimmel like Morning Star Award, something for best fantasy debut. And uh, I was reading an interview with him, where he was saying like that's basically like his hero and winning that award for his first book is just like was like a dream come true. Uh, but uh, you, the biggest question that people have for me with this is, is this grimdark? Because they know how much I love grimdark. Not quite. Is it traditional fantasy? Mm, somewhat, somewhat. So does it sound like I'm being kind of a Kind of confusing here. Well, that's not on accident. Uh, you know how Michael J. Sullivan, that's the guy who wrote the Right Era novels. Uh, Michael J. Sullivan, what I said I liked about him is I felt like he was taking traditional fantasy and he was kind of bringing it into the modern era. I feel like there's a lot of that because you have a lot of your traditional fantasy themes of light and dark, good versus bad, a chosen one, etc. But it does have that touch of grit, touch of darkness to it uh, and violence. But, you know, Never the pure nihilism that a lot of modern uh, grimdark has, has has kind of slid further and further into, which I love. But it doesn't it, do, it doesn't go quite like that. Um, I mean, if you're looking for blood and character deaths and things like, that, I mean, they're here, they're here. But you're not going to have you know two paragraph descriptions like Pierce Brown where you're talking about intestines falling out of somebody's stomach. You know, so it's not going to get quite like that. And it isn't just one of them you're just like, oh my God, everybody I love is just dying, dying, dying. Well, at least not yet. You know, I'm not done with the books yet. But uh, there has already been a couple of whoa, I didn't see that coming so already. So um, there is plenty of uh, of darkness, plenty of character deaths, and there are some glorious, glorious battle sequences in here just in the early going. And um, I've heard a lot of people say that they felt like the first book was just a lot of build. It is. It is a lot of character building. You know, you have to establish all these characters and all these lands and things like that. And that's where I can see the Song of Ice and Fire comparisons, because while I don't think it's a, a similar story, to a Song of Ice and Fire, not at all. I mean, I see people have seen the artwork of a uh, of one of the characters with a white wolf, and they or, and they assume, oh, okay, this is just you know, this is John Snow Rebel. Nah, it's not even close. Really, it isn't. It isn't. I know I, it would seem like that if you just went judging the book off of its cover there, but these covers are awesome. So I mean, judge away. Anyhow, uh, but it, it, this is mostly a fresh story here. But I, I think that fans of A Song of Ice and Fire are going to eat this up because you have just this large cast of characters and so many locations that it, at first it may seem overwhelming, kind of like A Game of Thrones, the first book in Song of Ice and Fire did, where you're just like, I got to start writing this down. Yeah, yeah, keep a little notepad. I keep a, 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 my phone and all I would do when I first started is every time they mentioned a new realm or a new kingdom, I would write it down and then I would just start to kind of just jot down some of those names because at first it can kind of seem like a lot of these names are kind of similar. And a lot of these names, you're just like, okay, I don't know what's going on here. If you're really into heavy fantasy, like a, a Wheel of Time or Malazan or something like that, you're going to be fine. This is actually going to kind of be quite light to you. If you've read the Song of Ice and Fire series, you'll, you'll be fine. I'm just saying, if this is your first step outside of like basic traditional fantasy, you, you might see like, oh, this is just too much at first. But like I always tell people with stories as big, is just at first, just write down some of the family names. Just kind of write down the family trees or whatever. There's no shame in it. You can't be expected to remember everything right away. Uh, but I, to me, that's where I really saw the Song of Ice and Fire comparisons there. And I, I say, yeah, I could see a fan of that series really 
eating this up and I am a fan of that series and I am eating this up. So um, I like that there's so many characters but there's never in a wait, 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 who is this again and where are they from? It doesn't feel like that. I feel like he gives you not like a rehash, but every once in a while he'll just kind of point out, you know, being the you know the first sort of King Brennan or something like that. It would it would just kind of oh okay I remember now. So it, it doesn't really hold your hand, but it doesn't just like throw you in the deep end and tell you to figure it out either. I, I have never once been like wait who is this character again? I've always been like okay I remember I remember. So I think you'll be fine in that regard. Um, about those characters, they are all very likable and that's something that i found a little differently you guys know how much i love uh, the first law by joe abercrombie but one thing uh, i will say about that series is you don't love all those characters right away in fact you question why you're loving them there's no question why you love these at, at first and uh, I, I think it's a uh, love in a different way because i mentioned you know uh, one of them's an outlaw and one of them is very clearly a villain and but you get to see those motivations and i think that always gives a villain more layers you know you just don't have the the mustache twirling disney bad guy you know you've, you've really got those layers you understand their motivations because i mean guys villains they don't usually think that they're the bad guys and i love that point of view getting to see that and i don't think we even got that in song of ice and fire that's that's something that i've always uh really really loved about some of these new stories that are doing this are showing us the point of view of what their motivations for doing the sinister shit that they're doing so uh, it's a really Really cool take, and, and I'm enjoying it quite a bit. But uh, yeah, these aren't just your usual assholes from Grimdark books. Again, I love the Grimdark subgenre, but if you don't want characters that you have a hard time getting behind, I don't think you have a hard time getting behind at least three or four of these POV characters like immediately, and their supporting characters around them. Uh, one of my favorite characters so far is named uh, Maquin, and he's just basically he's just a shield man for 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 Castell, and I, I love him. So I'm just like, if you're writing your secondary characters from another character's point of view that well, obviously you're hitting that sweet spot, that weakness that I have for just really really good character development. And I am already like attached to a few of these characters, and I'm like, everyone already has told you that John Gwynn will break your heart, and you're already falling in love with characters in the first book. So uh, they're just written that well. You really you just can't help it. You know you really can't help yourself, and that's never a bad thing. For me, I think I did tweet that, the, oh my God, the list of characters and locations when you first start this is just massive. But that is not a criticism coming from me. I have complained about some of these uh, authors who do so much world building that you feel like you're just like, okay, let me let me sit down for history class here. I haven't felt like that with this. I, it gives you that short prologue, which is like a brief past history of that war with the giant and, and, and men, the giants and men. And it, it was nothing like, okay, I'm lost. It was just like, okay, uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll get back to that. And when you'll get references, or I can go back and read that little blurb uh, again if I, if, uh, if I feel like I didn't get it the first time. But uh, you never feel like you're getting left behind here, and you never feel like you're sitting down for history class. Uh, you get the small bites that you need when you need them, and you'll get a little bit of backstory here and there. Like, it would just randomly say, oh, well, you know, this character, uh, yeah, his, his brother died, and this, and the king never forgave him because he thought it was his fault or something like that. And it's just nice little things. Oh, okay, all right, let me, let me keep that in mind because I feel like that's going to come back later. Um, what else? Uh, the quick chapters. These are really quick chapters. Uh, they're like 5 to 15, maybe 20 pages tops per character and you might think oh well, well that sounds like no no it's done in a way that keeps the pacing tight you never get bored of any character because you're getting such quick bites but never in a way where you're just like all right please stop jumping around because i want to know what's going on i haven't felt like that once yet i mean there have been a couple that have been like cliffhanger and i've been like all right well i'm re but i've never been like oh man i don't want to hear about this character right now even a song of ice and fire there were chapters where i was like oh not this character True, true. I mean, remember those Sansa, early Sansa chapters? Yeah. So um, <laughs> I haven't once been turned a page and saw it because each one has the character's name at the beginning of a chapter, like Song of Ice and Fire. And, and I've never once just like rolled my eyes or groaned and been like, okay, that's a good stopping part. It's not like it's another Elaine chapter from Wheel of Time or something. It's always a character around, oh, oh yeah, I want to see what they're up to right now. And it jumps around enough to where it feels like it's keeping it fresh, but never in a part where it's losing its focus. And that is a talent. And this is a debut novel. That's something, like I've mentioned with Pierce Brown, I'm sure he's going to get better each book like Pierce Brown did when he, when he first switched to multiple POVs. Uh, you know, you looked at it in Iron Gold, and it was like at the beginning of Iron Gold, it was kind of like, 
all right, this is kind of jarring because his first trilogy was only in, in you know, singular POV and then he moved to multiple. But by the, the second book where he's doing that was just like brilliant. So I'm pretty sure it's going to end up being like that with this guy too. And I'm loving it already. I have not had any problems with the pacing or how far it jumps around or the, the, the regions that it goes to. It's been a perfect balance so far. I've got about 220 pages left. So, I mean, look, these aren't short books either, guys. I mean, there's normal size font in there. So, I mean, it's a... It's just amazing how fast you can kind of roll through this. It's uh, it's so smooth. If I had to find a word for it, it's so smooth. I'm having such a good time and just kind of rolling through it. And you could read 100 pages and it don't feel like it at all. Like uh, I've been joking that I have not joking. It's serious, but I'm making a joke of it apparently. That uh, I have uh, two major assignments because I'm in my last two weeks of business school right now. And I keep putting them off so I can read more of this. So uh, Bad influence, John. Bad, bad, bad influence. Uh, the best... Thing for me starting this series why I decided to read it it's complete this guy has wrote seven and a half or some seven books in seven and a half years and they're all this size you don't have any George RR here you don't have any Patrick Rothfuss here you don't have any Scott Lynch here this guy writes like a machine and from what I understand he gets better and better almost every single review that you read for Faith on the Fallen and his second uh, trilogy, or his second trilogy, his continuation of this, his sequel trilogy uh, to this story uh, of Blood and Bone is everyone says his books, each one is better than the last one. And that's impressive because this is an impressive start. Very, very much so. Uh, it's got all the traditional fantasy stuff that you would love to see. It's got a lots of twists and turns already. And it's got just characters that you love and characters that you love to watch love one another you know you, the friendships in here are really really tight i've already i love the veritas and, and nathair bromance i am all for it i love it to death it is great i've already talked about castell and maquin that's a really good one the brother sister relationship between uh Sywin and corbin solid it's just strong i'm liking so many of these relationships already so uh that's really about it i do plan to do a non-spoiler review for the first book but i don't think i'll be doing one for each individual book because uh, I've always said I feel like it's it's foolish if you want to do non-spoiler reviews for a multi-book series because at that point it's like, look, after you read a book in a series or two books in a series, you're in or you're out. No spoiler or non-spoiler review is going to sell you one way or the other. So uh, since this series is so uh, kind of a hidden gem, so to speak, uh, there's not a lot of people talking about it, but there's also a lot of people like, I haven't heard about it from anybody but you, you know? So uh, I don't think I'm going to be doing numerous videos for this or whatever, but if I really, really like it, I'm just, I'm not going to stop talking about it. And a lot of people are telling me, yeah, you just did your top 10 fantasy series. You're going to have to adjust that when you finish this. So um, it's definitely off to a good start. And that is where I'm at right now, guys. I hope this has given you some uh, answers if you were looking for them. Uh, for me, it, like I said, it's, it's more of a why I decided to read and less of a why you should read. Uh, I just know that there was a lot of, I, since I have started it, I wanted to tell you about some of those things to kind of give you that itch. You can buy this whole series on Amazon for like 35 bucks. I, and I think the digital is even less. Uh, so uh, I definitely, if you want to check it out, I'd say do that. I'll put a, a link in the uh, description or if you want to go uh, purchase that, I I know it's if not everyone purchases books they've never read before like I do or whatever, but this is one that I'm already feeling like I made the right decision and I can't wait to keep going. So guys, if you've uh, if you've read it, uh, please drop in the comments, tell people why you love it, but try to keep the spoilers because I just started. I don't want to know. Uh, if I really, really get into it, I might do a, a, a recap for the series and open it up for spoilers if you've read it there or something like that. But let's try to keep it to non-spoilers or if you're interested in trying it. And I'll try to answer any questions that you might have in the comments so far. So hit me in the comments, guys, and I will talk to you there. Truth and courage.